Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Scams Fire God by Algis Bidris The Short Snorter by Charles Einstein Perfect Answer by L. J. Stetcher, Jr. Atomic Bonanza by George O. Smith Alois by R. A. Lafferty Fire God by Algis Bedris Writing as William Scarf Originally published in Rocket Stories, July 1953 Narrated by Tom Trissel Your Majesty, the High Mersu Emperor of all the suns, protector of the galaxy, looked up calmly as its prime minister burst into the room. His lean, brooding face did not change expression as he watched the pale and perspiring man cross the flagstoned floor with a sharp, nervous patter of leather. "'Gently, Tors, gently,' he said quietly, his eyes mocking under their overhang of dark eyebrow. Your Prime Minister now, remember that. A Prime Minister doesn't come blundering into the palace looking as though the sky was falling. It creates unrest in the population. Try to remember that we're no longer a pair of obscure rebel rousers trying to overthrow the Crown. We are the Crown now. Try to act like it. The high, the sky is falling! Tors burst out unheedingly. I have word that the Earthmen are driving beyond the rim and into the heart of the Empire itself. Their ships are irresistible. They are winning battle after battle, and the people are restless. They say it's time the false Emperor's rule was overthrown. Some of the garrisons are rebelling. Still the Emperor's expression did not change. So, he said calmly, the Earthmen were not bluffing when they said they'd maintain the rights of the old Emperor. Yes, you said they wouldn't, Dahai. What are we going to do? I was wrong, Tors, Mersu said evenly. No matter. As for what we are going to do, why, I suppose you'd better arrange for another broadcast. Tell the people we have weapons ready if the situation becomes serious, that they have nothing to fear. But the situation is serious, and what weapons? No weapons, Tors, Mersu explained patiently, but the story will serve to keep the people calm, and perhaps make them think twice about revolt. Now go, hurry. The Prime Minister's feet pattered over the floor again. The door to the room closed. Mersu smiled quietly. He rose and opened the concealed door behind his chair. Closing it behind him, he slipped into a passage of which no one knew, and ten minutes later he was in a private tubeway that led halfway across the continent into the heart of an old and barren mountain range. As he sat comfortably in the padded upholstery of the tube car, Mersu smiled again. Poor Tors, so excitable, always the hysteric, a perfect rabble-rouser perhaps, but not a clever man, no, never a clever man. A clever man knew when the game was over, and Mersu laughed. The game had been worth it. Five years ago he had been a revolutionary, slinking through the alleys at night, always in danger, and always clever. Four years of that, and then empire, absolute rule over the entire greater Magellanic cloud. Now he was once again in danger, but it was a danger he had long ago foreseen and planned for, and the past year had been worth it. He laughed again. Poor, adult-witted Tors, left with the empty bag in his hands. 
the spaceship rested like a crouching bullet in its chamber. As he slid the tubeway door shut behind him, Mercer admired the savage sleekness of its lines once again. Even more, he admired his cleverness in having it built. A clever man always has a back door. He crossed the hangar floor unhurriedly and climbed into the ship. The control room was small but efficient. A hundred controls lay closely around the padded chair, some of them for the standard drive, others for the hyperspatial warp. The hyperspatial warp, Mercer smiled. There was his escape, and more. Here were the means for his future rulership over nothing so small as the cloud. Here were entire galaxies waiting for his hand. Hyperspace. There was something to make a man think. Another universe, not beyond, but alongside his own, hidden in the complex byways of Riemannian geometry and the mathematics of Einstein. A universe where time itself ran slower, where a year of normal time encompassed centuries. A ship could twist itself into that universe and travel just below the speed of light, the limit which, in normal space, was the barrier no ship could cross. But in hyperspace, while the same barrier existed, a man from normal space could travel for centuries, covering great distances, while for him only a few months passed. Mersu chuckled. Behind him, stored in the great holes of the ship, were working models of every machine and weapon the cloud civilization possessed. There were plans, manuals, instructions, all translated into basic symbology that any intelligent being could understand. Packed into this ship was an entire civilization, ready to be brought to whatever people Mersu chose. He had only to enter hyperspace and lose himself where no earthman or rebel could follow. And there he would find a primitive race barely beginning to rise out of the mud. He would bring them civilization. In return, he would have godhood. They would worship him, those primitive people. He would be Mersu, the fire god, thundering out of the sky, bringing with him the gift of civilization. And once the gift was given, he would climb back into the sky on a pillar of fire, promising to return when his people were ready. He laughed aloud, the deep bass sound echoing through the control chamber. Why not? He could fly back into space and spend a year waiting, while centuries passed on the primitive world. When he returned, that world would be his, and soon afterward the entire universe would bow before the name of Mersu, the immortal fire god, for there is no force so strong, no loyalty so great, as that of men for their gods. Still laughing, he blasted the ship out of its hangar into the darkness of space, and a little later into hyperspace, while well, the big blue ships of Earth smashed his discarded empire behind him. In a month he had found his planet and his people. They were almost human in appearance, but shorter. So much the better. He was like them, but just different enough to be a god. He brought his ship roaring down through the atmosphere, trailing a streamer of flame. As he passed over the sea that covered most of the world, the wash of his jets kicked the water into froth, and the sound of his passage echoed through the sky. The village rested on the shore of the sea. The mud huts trembled as his ship sank down, resting on its jet stream until it settled slowly to the ground. Smiling faintly, Mersu put on his spacesuit, strapping his anti-gravity harness on over it. He flew out over his upper airlock, carrying a gun in his hand. He hovered in the air above the village. He pointed the gun into the air and fired. 
A cone of flame shot toward the sky. He pointed the gun at the sea, and towering curtains of steam rose to hang over the village. Mursu descended, and found his people groveling in the mud. Weeks passed. A stream of men carried the ship's cargo into a great sprawling building that Mursu carved out of a stone cliff with a summer topic cutter. The lintels of the building were sanctified with the blood of virgins. A new class of people arose in the village, the priests of Mursu, the fire god. And as the ship rose up into space again, on its journey back into the normal space where Mursu would wait his year and the centuries would pass for his people, the priests chanted over their altars. He will return. Mursu goes to his kingdom in the sky, but he will return bearing flame in his hands. Mursu, the fire god, Mursu, the immortal bringer of fire, will return. And the centuries passed. Mursu brought his ship out of the sky, tearing the air as he came, the growl of his jets thundering over the mighty city on the sea. The sound echoed back from the carved face of the Temple of Mursu and beat against the spreading buildings. The ship settled to earth. Mursu strapped on his antigrav unit and flashed out into the air above the city. He fired his gun into the sea and the steam curtain rose once more. He pointed the gun skyward and the heavens danced with flame. A low, snarling car bearing the sign of Mercer's priesthood drove up to him as he touched the ground. Two men got out and walked toward him, one of them dressed in the sombre black of the priesthood. Mercer stood waiting, his eyes lighting with triumphant fire. "'Who are you?' the priest asked. Mercer stared, the pose broken. Who am I? Kneel, fool! I am Mursu, the fire god. The two men looked at him speechlessly for a moment, then burst into laughter. Mursu! The priest wiped his eyes. The other man's laughter trailed into anger. Watch your tongue, blasphemer! He said curtly, drawing a gun from its holster. Mursu! The priest repeated. You're the fool, stranger! At least the others who tried to claim his godhood had the sense to disguise themselves to resemble his pictures. Pictures change, rash priest, Mursu thundered. I am the fire god. Look on my power. Once more he fired into the sea, and once more the steam pillars rose. I am the god of fire. I fly in the hands of flame. I walk on the air. I burn the land and the sea. I am Mursu. The priest's face lost its tolerant amusement. His mouth twisted in scorn. Walk on the air, do you? In a Mark Eleven antigrav belt, yes. Burn sea and land, eh? With a sun gun, certainly. Fly in the hands of flame? If you wish to be picturesque about it, yes. But so does every drunkle fool of a spaceman. I tell you I am Mursu, Mursu screamed. Bow down and worship. Silence, the priest's voice was dangerous. You will come with us to the temple. There you'll see how we worship impostors. I'll kill you, Mursu shouted, raising his gun. The priest motioned with his hand. The man with him blew Mursu's head off. Blasphemer. The priest spat disdainfully, his voice filled with disgust. He and his retainer turned back to the car, leaving the body to be carted away later. Every evening at sunset, the priests of Mursu stand over their altars and intone the words, He will return, Mursu the fire god, Mursu the immortal bringer of fire, will return. 
and the people of Mercer's world intone in reply, He will return. Throughout the galaxies of hyperspace, wherever the men of Mercer's world may wander, there are other priests and other races that respond, but the ritual is always the same. He will return. And the city waits, the planet waits, and the other planets about the other stars through all the galaxies of hyperspace wait. They always will. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Short Snorter by Charles Einstein Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, August 1958 Narrated by Tom Trussell Three paths led through the woods away from the resort hotel, and of the three, two were clearly marked, one with a sign that said it led to the lake, the other pointing to all the golf links. The third pathway was unmarked, and this was the one that inevitably the lovers and the honeymooners took, the path that Alice and Fred Daniels followed today. The sun was unusually warm for this time of year, but only a few yards along the pathway Fred and Alice were swallowed up by the great and near great trees of the forest. The sunlight was, except for an occasional patch of light here and there, warded away by the foliage above. The forest was very quiet. The pathway bridged a silent brook, and then, perhaps a third of a mile into the woods, turned abruptly to the left, and the woods became even more dense, the pathway narrow. Through the trees to the right at this point was a clearing, an unusual grassy circle perhaps sixty yards in diameter. It was not the clearing itself, however, but instead the glint of colour in the sunlight that caused Fred and Alice to stop and look. Alice said, Fred, what is that? Don't know, he said. Something red. Let's look. The two of them turned off the path and made their way through a dismal barrage of thicket to the clearing that lay beyond. When they got there, they saw the circular object. Vehicle might be a better word. It was possibly fifteen yards in diameter. It seemed to be made of three rings, smaller ones bottom and top, and the larger one ribbing the centre and to be constructed of some kind of plastic. Between the central and upper rings was set a series of small windows. The entire thing was painted a gaudy red. What do you think it is? Fred said. A flying saucer, Alice said promptly. She laughed a little, but clutched at her husband's arm. Isn't it? I don't know. But what else could it be? I don't know, Fred said again. Let's look inside. Fred, Alice said, you'd better not. Don't be silly, he said, and walked resolutely up to the object and, standing on tiptoe, peered through one of the windows. What is it? Alice called from the edge of the clearing. What do you see? It's empty, he called back. What's inside? Fred shook his head. You won't believe it. What? It's got a steering wheel he called out hollowly, and some dials. My goodness, Alice said. Is it a real one? How do I know, he said and rejoined her, casting a series of glances uncertainly over his shoulder at the bright red saucer behind him. What do you suppose we ought to do? Tell somebody, Alice said. I suppose. Who do we tell? I don't know. There must be somebody. They looked almost guiltily at each other. "'Nobody'll believe us,' Fred said. "'Why not?' Alice said. "'It's here, isn't it?' Fred stopped and thought. "'Who knows how long it'll stay?' They looked at each other again. Then Alice said slowly, "'If we went back and got the camera—' 
Swiftly, they made their way back toward the hotel through the quiet forest. When they got there, they found Mr. Mason, the manager of the hotel, adjusting the badminton net in front of the main porch. Mr. Mason loosed a ready smile. "'How's everything?' he said. "'Find enough to do?' "'Yes, thank you,' Fred said to him. "'We were just walking through the woods. We came back for a camera. Then we're off again.' Mr. Mason nodded. "'Find the saucer?' Fred looked at him. "'You mean the flying saucer?' The manager nodded again. "'I see you did find it. Good. Take a picture of it by all means. I've already taken a whole batch myself.' "'You have?' Fred said, frowning. "'What's it all about?' "'It's a flying saucer,' Mr. Mason said. "'From Venus. Mr. Steriot, who piloted it, is a guest here. I can introduce you to him if you like.' He speaks excellent English. Fred Daniel said, Wait a minute, you... Oh, there's no point in it, Mr. Mason said in a weary tone of voice. No point in it at all. I took pictures. I tried to get the army up here. I wrote letters. He shrugged expressively. It's a cynical age we live in, I guess. No, everybody's very polite, but they make it clear they think it's just a gimmick I worked up to get the hotel publicity. He nodded seriously. The whole pro trouble's with Mr. Steriot. If he had a light bulb for a head, or seven legs, or talked funny, why, it'd be a different thing entirely. But he looks and acts just like you or I. Here I've got a legitimate flying saucer sitting on my property, and you might as well try to tell them it's a, well, a flying saucer. For all they believe me. Now you two have seen it with your own eyes, and you don't believe it either. Fred swallowed and looked at Alist for a moment. Then he said, "'What did you say his name was?' "'Mr. Steriot. Mr. Mason said. "'Actually, he's just as happy nobody believes he's from Venus. "'If they believed it, they'd probably lock him up in jail somewhere "'or impound his saucer. "'As it is, he says this is the first vacation he's had in years.' "'Mr. Mason looked unhappily about him. "'He's probably in the lounge now. "'Want to meet him?' Fred said dazedly. "'I—' "'Ah, come on,' Mr. Mason said. "'He won't bite you.' He led the way up the steps of the porch and into the lounge and over to where a small, moustachioed man, wearing eyeglasses and appearing to be in his late forties, was working a crossword puzzle in the morning paper. "'Mr. Steriot,' Mr. Mason said, "'I should like you to meet Mr. and Mrs. Daniels, also guests here.' They've just seen your saucer. Charmed, Mr. Steriot said, and got to his feet. He shook hands with Fred Daniels. Are you here for a long stay, Mr. Daniels? I'm not sure, Fred said a little unhappily. Mr. Mason told us you were from Venus. I told them about you, Mr. Steriot, Mr. Mason said. Naturally, they don't believe it any more than anybody else. No reason why they should, Mr. Steriot said amicably. No reason in the world, if I may coin a phrase, Dr. Phelps at the Institute didn't believe it either. Mr. Mason said, Mr. Steriot here has a long interview with Dr. Phelps of the Geophysical Institute at Princeton when he first arrived here on Earth with us. Oh, Fred said. He gazed uncomfortably at Mr. Steriot. We didn't mean to interrupt you. I was only doing the crossword puzzle, Mr. Steriot said. Do you know a two-letter word for sun god? Alice said, "'Is this your first trip here?' "'You mean here to the hotel?' Mr. Steriot said. "'Or to Earth?' "'Earth,' Fred said dismally. "'My second, Mr. Steriot said. First trip I round up near Leningrad. Terrible time. I thought they'd talk English, but they don't, and they thought I was an American, and two other officials got into the saucer with me, and the only way I could save myself was to take off with them. They're on Venus now.' This accounts, Mr. Mason broke in, for the way those two high Russian officials suddenly disappeared from sight three years ago. You remember? Everybody thought they'd been liquidated. Fred Daniels looked around the room. A hollow, frightening feeling had come upon him. There were hundreds of questions he could have asked, and yet he wanted nothing so much as to be away from there. His wife Alice, though, was constrained to learn more about Mr. Steriot. She said, "'Mr. Steriot, may I ask you something?' 
By all means, Mr. Steriot said, and blinked owlishly at her. Do you, Alice said to him, carry any money? It was, Fred Daniels realised, a marvellous question. If there were sham here, this would be the quickest way to. Why, of course, Mr. Steriot said, and reached for his wallet. Let's see. Health insurers, sources, driving licence. Here, my dear, a five Gino bill. He extracted a yellow banknote and handed it to Alice. The banknote, slightly larger than an American dollar bill, was remarkably similar in other particulars. It had upon it a picture of a flying saucer, the figure five, and it spelled out, Five Genos. Let me sign it for you, Mr. Steriot said, taking out a pen. You can have it for a souvenir. Like the short snorters in the war, Mr. Mason, the hotel manager, said. You remember them, Mr. Daniels? Where people got famous signatures on five and ten and twenty dollar bills and exchanged them and what not, and they called them short snorters. I remember, Fred Daniels said, something like that. Five Genos on Venus, Mr. Steriot said, signing his name with a flourish, is worth about twenty dollars here on Earth. No official rate of exchange, of course, but from what I've seen, that's about what I'd judge. Here you go. He handed the bill over. Well, wait then, Fred Daniel said. I ought to sign one of our bills for you. Ah, no need for that, Mr. Steriot said. No doubt you need twenty dollars worse than I need five Genos. Don't be ridiculous, Fred said, a little stiffly, and, by now committed, he went into his wallet and came out with a twenty-dollar bill. He signed his name to it, using Mr. Steriot's fountain pen. Wonderful, Mr. Steriot said. How nice to have met you both. I feel very badly about this, Mr. Mason, the hotel manager, said to Fred and Alice. The three of them were on the porch outside. This short snorter business always seems to happen whenever I introduce Mr. Steriot to anyone. Dr. Phelps at the Institute gave him fifty dollars. Can you imagine that? It's interesting in its way, Fred said. It just occurred to me, Mr. Steriot can spend Earth money here, but we can't spend Venus money. That's true, Mr. Mason said. On the other hand, Mr. Steriot has never once, to my knowledge, been the one to bring up the subject. I think it's quite painful to him, really. But the same thing inevitably occurs to everybody he meets. You know, let's see the colour of a money. I guess people are pretty much the same everywhere, that is, everywhere on earth. They judge everything in terms of money, including whether you've even been born on earth. Let's see your money, they say to Mr. Steriot, and out he comes with one of those damned five Gino bills, and we're off. You know... Alice Daniel said thoughtfully. In a way, it's a lesson. Isn't it, Fred? I mean, everybody is money-conscious. Maybe too much so. I'm not sorry it cost us twenty dollars to meet Mrs. Steriot. You may be right, Fred said to her. You may be right. Who knows, some day this five Gino bill may be a very valuable... There you go again, Alice cut in, always putting it in terms of money. "'But you're the one,' Fred said, "'who thought to ask him about it in the first place.' "'Don't quarrel,' Mr. Mason, the hotel manager, said to them. "'After all, for you it's just a vacation. "'For me, I've got this man sitting in my lounge, "'day in and day out, doing crossword puzzles "'and trading short snorters with my guests. "'Nobody really believes he's from Venus. "'Nobody important, anyway. "'It's a little frightening when you're trying to run a happy hotel.' Sometimes I wish he'd go back to wherever he came from. Well, Fred said, he's bound to leave one of these days. Maybe, Mr. Mason said doubtfully. Offhand, though, I'd say the way he's taken it in, he can't afford to. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Perfect Answer by L. J. Stetcher Jr. Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, June 1958. Narrated by Tom Trussell. As one god to another, let's go home, 
Jack Bates said. Bill Farnham raised a space-gloved hand in negligent acknowledgement to a hastily kneeling native, and shook his head at Bates. "'Let's try Deneb. It's almost in line on the way back, and then we can call it quits. "'But I want to get back and start making some profit out of this. "'The galaxy is full of Homo sapiens. We've hit the jackpot first trip out. "'Let's hurry on home and cash in. "'We need more information. This is too much of a good thing. It doesn't make sense. "'I know there isn't much chance of finding anything out by stopping at one more solar system.' but it won't delay us more than a few weeks, and it won't hurt to try. Yeah, said Bates, but what's in it for us? And what if we find an inhabited planet? You know the chances are about two to one that we will. That'll make thirteen we've found on this trip. Why risk bad luck? You're no more superstitious than I am, said Farnham. You just want to get back Earthside. I'll tell you what, we'll toss a coin for it. Bates gestured futilely toward his coverall pocket, and then remembered he was wearing a spacesuit as a precaution against possible contamination from the natives. "'I will use one of my coins this time,' said Farnham, noticing the automatic motion. "'I want to have a chance.' The coin dropped in Farnham's favour, and the two-man scout ship hurtled itself into space. Farnham operated the compact computer— aligning the ship's velocity vector precisely while the stars could still be seen. Bates controlled the engines, metering their ravenous demand for power just this side of destructive detonation, while the ship sucked energy from space, from the adjacent universe on the other side of limbo. Finally, the computer chimed, relays snicked, and the ship slid into the emptiness of limbo as the stars winked out. With two trained men working as a team with a computer and the elaborate engine room controls, and with a certain amount of luck, the ship would drop back into normal space a couple of weeks later, close beside their target. "'Well, that's that,' said Farnham, relaxing and wiping the perspiration off his forehead. "'We're back once again in the nothingness of nowhere. As I recall, it's your week for KP. Where's the coffee?' "'Coming right up,' said Bates. "'But you won't like it. "'It's the last of the god-food the Korite priests made for us.' "'Farnham shuddered. "'Pour it out and make some fresh. "'With a skillet, you stink, but you're a thousand times better than Korites.' "'Thanks,' Bates said, getting busy. "'It was the third place we stopped that there were such good cooks, wasn't it?' "'Nope. "'Our third stop was the Porandians.' They try to kill us, call us devil spawn from the stars. You're thinking of the fourth stop, the Balanites. Bates shrugged. It's kind of hard to keep them all straight. Either they fall on their knees and worship us, or they try to kill us without even asking questions. Maybe it's lucky they're all so primitive. It may be lucky, but it doesn't add up. More than half the stars we visit have planets that can support human life and every one that can does. Once there must have been an interstellar empire. So why are all the civilizations so backward? They aren't primitive, they're decadent. And why do they all have such strong feelings, one way or the exact opposite, about people from the stars? Isn't that why you want to try one more system? asked Bates. To give us another chance to get some answers. Here's your coffee. Try to drink it quietly. I'm going to get some shut-eye. The trip through the limbo between adjacent universes passed uneventfully, as always. The computer chimed again on schedule, and a quick check by Farnham showed the blazing sun that suddenly appeared was Deneb, as advertised. Seventeen planets could be counted, and the fifth seemed to be Earth-type. They approached it with the easy skill of long practice and swung into orbit about it. "'This is what we've been looking for!' exclaimed Farnham, examining the planet through a telescope. "'They've got big cities and dams and bridges. They're civilised. Let's put the ship down.' "'Wait up,' said Bates. "'What if they've got Starmanphobia? Remember, they're people, just like us. And with people, civilization and weapons go together.' "'I think you got it backwards.' 
If they hate us, we can probably get away before they bring up their big artillery. But what if they love us? They might want to keep us beside them forever. Bates nodded. I'm glad you agree with me. Let's get out of here. Nobody but us knows of the beautiful, profitable planets we've found, all ready to become part of a Terran Empire. And if we don't get back safe and sound, nobody will know. The information we've got is worth a fortune to us, and I want to be alive to collect it. Sure, but we've got the job of trying to find out why all those planets reverted to barbarism. This one hasn't. Maybe the answer's here. There's no use setting up an empire if it won't last. It'll last long enough to keep you and me on top of the heap. That's not good enough. I want my kids, when I have them, to have their chances at the top of the heap too. Oh, all right. We'll flip a coin, then. We already did. You may be a sharp dealer, but you never welch on a bet. We're going down. Bates shrugged. You win. Let's put her down beside that big city over there. The biggest one, by the seashore. As they approached the city, they noticed at its outskirts a large flat plain dotted with gantries. Like a spaceport, suggested Bill. That's our target. They landed neatly on the tarmac, and then sat there quietly, waiting to see what would happen. A crowd began to form. The two men sat tensely at their controls, but the throng clustering about the base of the ship showed no hostility. They also showed no reverence, but rather a carefree interest and joyful welcome. Well, said Farnham at last, looks like we might as well go outside and ask them to take us to their leader. I'm with you as usual, said Bates, starting to climb into his spacesuits. Weapons? I don't think so. We can't stop them if they get mad at us, and they look friendly enough. We'll start off with let's be pals routine. Bates nodded. After we learn the language, I always hate this part. It moves so slowly. You'd think there'd be some similarity among the tongues on different planets, wouldn't you? But each one's entirely different. I guess they've all been isolated too long. The two men stepped out on the smooth plain, to be instantly surrounded by a laughing, chattering crowd. Farnham stared around in bewilderment at the variety of dress the crowd displayed. There were men and women in togas, in tunics, in draped dresses and kilts, in trousers and coats. Others considered a light cloak thrown over the shoulders to be adequate. There was no uniformity of style or custom. "'You pick me a boss-man out of this bunch,' he muttered to Bates. Finally, a couple of young men, glowing with health and energy, came bustling through the crowd with an oblong box which they set down in front of the earthman. They pointed to the box, and then back at Farnham and Bates, laughing and talking as they did so. "'What do you suppose they want us to do?' Farnham asked. One of the young men clapped his hands happily and reached down to touch the box. "'What do you suppose they want us to do?' asked the box distinctly. "'Ah, a recording machine. Probably to help with language lessons. Might as well help them out.' Farnham and Bates took turns talking at the box for half an hour. Then the young man nodded, laughed, clapped his hands again, and the two men carried it away. The crowd went with them, waving merrily as they departed. Bates shrugged his shoulders and went back into the ship, with Farnham close behind. A few hours after sunrise the following morning, the crowd returned, as gay and carefree as before, led by the two young men who had carried the box. Each of these two now had a small case, about the size of a camera, slung by a strap across one brawny shoulder. As the terrestrials climbed out to meet them, the two men raised their hands and the crowd discontinued its chatter, falling silent except for an occasional tinkle of surprised laughter. "'Welcome,' said the first young man clearly. "'It is a great pleasure for us to have our spaceport in use again. 
It has been many generations since any ships have landed on it. Farnham noticed that the voice came from the box. Thank you for your very kind welcome, he said. I hope that your traffic will soon increase. May we congratulate you, by the way, on the efficiency of your translators. Thanks, laughed the young man. But there was nothing to it. We just asked the oracle, and he told us what we had to do to make them. May we meet your oracle? Oh, sure, if you want to. But later on. Now it's time for a party. Why don't you take off those clumsy suits and come along? We don't dare remove our spacesuits. They protect us from any disease germs you may have, and you from any we may have. We probably have no resistance to each other's ailments. The Oracle says we have nothing that will hurt you, and we're going to spray you with this as soon as you get out of your suits. Then you won't hurt any of us. He held up a small atomizer. Farnham glanced at Bates, who shrugged and nodded. They uneasily unfastened their spacesuits and stepped out of them, wearing only their light one-piece coveralls, and got sprayed with a pleasant-smelling mist. The party was a great success. The food was varied and delicious. The liquors were sparkling and stimulating, without unpleasant after-effects. The women were uninhibited. When a native got tired, he just dropped down to the soft grass, or onto an even softer couch, and went to sleep. The earthman finally did the same. They awoke the following morning, within minutes of each other, feeling comfortable and relaxed. Bates shook his head experimentally. No hangover, he muttered in surprise. No one ever feels bad after a party, said one of their guides, who had slept nearby. The oracle told us what to do when we asked him. Quite a fellow, your oracle, commented Bates. Does he answer you in riddles like most oracles? The guide was shocked. The oracle answers any questions promptly and completely. He never talks in riddles. Can we go to see him now? asked Farnham. Certainly. Come along. I'll take you to the hall of the oracle. The oracle appeared to live in a building of modest size, in the centre of a tremendous courtyard. The structure that surrounded the courtyard, in contrast, was enormous and elaborate, dominating the wildly architectured city. It was, however, empty. "'Scholars used to live in this building, they tell me,' said one of their guides, gesturing casually. "'They used to come here to learn from the Oracle. But there's no sense in learning a lot of stuff when the Oracle has always got all the answers anyway. So now the building is empty.' The big palace was built back in the days when we used to travel among the stars, as you do now. How long ago was that? asked Farnham. Oh, I don't know. A few thousand years, a few hundred years. The oracle can tell you if you really want to know. Bates raised an eyebrow. And how do you know you'll always be given the straight dope? The guide looked indignant. The oracle always tells the truth. Yes, Bates persisted, but how do you know? The oracle told us so, of course. Now why don't you go in and find out for yourselves? We'll wait out here. We don't have anything to ask him. Bates and Farnham went into the building and found themselves in a small pleasant room furnished with comfortable chairs and sofas. Good morning, said a well-modulated voice. I have been expecting you. You're the oracle? asked Farnham, looking around curiously. The name that the people of this planet have given me translates most accurately as oracle, said the voice. But are you actually an oracle? My principal function, insofar as human beings, that is, Homo sapiens, are concerned, is to give accurate answers to all questions propounded me. Therefore, insofar as humans are concerned, I am actually an oracle. Then you have another function. My principal function, insofar as the race that made me is concerned, is to act as a weapon. 
Oh, said Bates, then you are a machine. I am a machine, agreed the voice. The people who brought us here say that you always tell them the truth. I suppose that applies when you are acting as an oracle instead of as a weapon. On the contrary, said the voice blandly, I function as a weapon by telling the truth. That doesn't make any sense, protested Bates. The machine paused for a moment before replying. This will take a little time, gentlemen, it said but I am sure that I can convince you. Why don't you sit down and be comfortable? If you want refreshments, just ask for them. Might as well, said Bates, sitting down in an easy chair. How about giving us some Corite cod food? If you really want that bad a brew of coffee, I can make it for you, of course, said the voice, but I am sure you would prefer some of better quality. Farnham laughed. Yes, please. Some good coffee, if you don't mind. Now, said the oracle, after excellent coffee had been produced, it is necessary for me to go back into history a few hundred thousand of your years. At that time, the people who made me entered this galaxy on one of their periodic visits of routine exploration, and contacted your ancestors. The race that constructed me populates now, as it did then, the Greater Magellanic Cloud. Frankly, the Magellanic race was appalled at what they found. In the time since their preceding visit, your race had risen from the slime of your mother planet and was on its way toward stars. The speed of your development was unprecedented in millions of years of history. By their standards, your race was incredibly energetic, incredibly fecund, incredibly intelligent, unbelievably warlike, and almost completely depraved. Extrapolation revealed that within another fifty thousand of your years you would complete the population of this galaxy and would be totally unstoppable. Something had to be done, fast. There were two obvious solutions, but both were unacceptable to my makers. The first was to assume direct control over your race and to maintain that rule indefinitely, until such time as you changed your natures sufficiently to become civilizable. The expenditure of energy would be enormous, and the results probably catastrophic to your race. No truly civilized people could long contemplate such a solution. The second obvious answer was to attempt to extirpate you from this universe as if you were a disease, as in a sense, you are. Because your depravity was not total or necessarily permanent, this solution was also abhorrent to my makers and was rejected. What was needed was a weapon that would keep operating without direct control by my people, which would not result in any greater destruction or harm to humans than was absolutely necessary, and one which would cease entirely to operate against you if you changed sufficiently to become civilizable, to become good neighbors to my makers. The final solution of the Magellanic race was to construct several thousand spaceships, each containing an elaborate computer constructed so as to give accurate answers throughout your galaxy. I am one of those ships. We have performed our function in a satisfactory manner and will continue to do so as long as we are needed. And that makes you a weapon? asked Bates incredulously. I don't get it. Farnham felt a shiver go through him. I see it. The concept is completely diabolical. It is not diabolical at all, answered the oracle. When you become capable of civilization, we can do you no further harm at all. We will cease to be a weapon at that time. You mean you'll stop telling the truth at that time? asked Bates. We will continue to function in accordance with our design, answered the voice, but it will no longer do you harm. Incidentally, your phrase, telling the truth, is almost meaningless. We answer all questions in the manner most completely understandable to you, 
within the framework of your language and your understanding, and of the understanding and knowledge of our makers. In the objective sense, what we answer is not necessarily the truth. It is merely the truest form of the answer that we can state in a manner that you can understand. And you'll answer any question at all? asked Bates in some excitement. With one or two exceptions. We will not, for example, tell you how we may be destroyed. Bates stood up and began pacing the floor. Then whoever possesses you can be the most powerful man in the universe. No, only in this galaxy. That's good enough for me. Jack, said Farnham urgently, let's get out of here. I want to talk to you. In a minute, in a minute, said Bates impatiently. I've got one more question. He turned to face the wall from which the disembodied voice appeared to emanate. Is it possible to arrange it so that you would answer only one man's questions? Mine, for example. I can tell you how to arrange it so that I will respond to only your questions, for so long as you are alive. Come on, pleaded Farnham. I've got to talk to you right now. OK, said Bates, smiling. Let's go. When they were back in the ship, Farnham turned desperately to Bates. Can't you see what a deadly danger that machine is to us all? We've got to warn Earth as fast as we can and get them to quarantine this planet and any other planets we find that have oracles. Oh, no, you don't, said Bates. You aren't getting the chance to have the oracle all to yourself. With that machine, we can rule the whole galaxy. We'll be the most powerful people who ever lived. It's sure lucky for us that you won the toss of the coin and we stopped here. But don't you see that the oracle will destroy Earth? Bourgeois! You heard it say it can only destroy people who aren't civilised. It said that it's a spaceship, so I'll bet we can get it to come back to Earth with us and tell us how we can be the only ones who can use it. We've got to leave here right away, without asking it any more questions. Bates shook his head. Quit clowning! I never meant anything more in my life. Once we start using that machine, if we ask it even one question to gain advantage for ourselves, Earth civilization is doomed. Can't you see that's what happened to those other planets we visited? Can't you see what is happening to this planet we're on now? No, I can't, answered Bates stubbornly. The Oracle said there are only a few thousand like him. You could travel through space for hundreds of years and never be lucky enough to find one. There can't be an oracle on every planet we visited. There wouldn't have to be, said Farnham. There must be hundreds of possible patterns, all of them destructive in the presence of greed and laziness and lust for power. For example, a planet, maybe this one, gets space travel. It sets up colonies on several worlds. It's expanding and dynamic. Then it finds an oracle and takes it back to its own world. With all questions answered for it, the civilization stops being dynamic and starts to stagnate. It stops visiting its colonies and they drift toward barbarism. Later, Farnham went on urgently, somebody else reaches the stars, finds the planet with the oracle and takes the thing back home. Can you imagine what will happen to these people on this world if they lose their oracle? Their own learning and traditions and way of life have been destroyed. Just take a look at their anarchic clothing and architecture. The oracle is the only thing that keeps them going, downhill, and makes sure they don't start back again. It won't happen that way to us, Bates argued. We won't let the oracle get into general use, so Earth won't ever learn to depend on it. I'm going to find out from it how to make it work for the two of us alone. You can come along and share the gravy, or not as you choose. I don't care, but you aren't going to stop me. Bates turned and strode out of the ship. Farnham pounded his fist into his palm in despair, and then ran to a locker. Taking out a high-power express rifle, he loaded it carefully and stepped out through the airlock. Bates showed clearly in his telescopic sights, still walking toward the hall of the Oracle. Farnham fired at the legs but he wasn't that good a shot. The bullet went through the back. 
Farnham jittered between bringing Bates back and taking off as fast as the ship could go. The body still lay there, motionless. There was nothing he could do for the Oracle's first Earth victim. The first and the last, he swore grimly. He had to speed home and make them understand the danger before they found another planet with an Oracle, so that they could keep clear of its deadly temptations. The Magellanic race could be outwitted yet, in spite of their lethal cleverness. Then he felt a sudden icy chill along his spine. Alone, he could never operate the spaceship. And Bates was dead. He was trapped on the planet. For hours he tried to think of some way of warning Earth. It was imperative that he get back. There had to be a way. He realised, finally, that there was only one solution to his problem. He sighed shudderingly, and walked slowly from the spaceship toward the hall of the Oracle, past Bates's body. One question, though, he muttered to himself, only one. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Atomic Bonanza by George O. Smith Originally published in Science Fiction Quarterly, May 1951 Narrated by Tom Trussell The visitor arriving at General Atomic Research climbed a broad flight of stairs and then encountered a sort of plaza presided over by a rare combination of brains and beauty. Here the visitor inspected the beauty while the brains inspected the visitor's credentials. After which mutual inspection, the visitor stepped into the exact centre of a long corridor and turned either to the right or to the left, depending upon which of the two main offices he was to visit. At one end, was the office of Dr. Howard Mangler, Director of Research. At the other end of the corridor was the office of Philip Newton, Director of Operations. Between the two was a corridor called the Battlefield by the clerks, stenographers and office boys. Up and down the silent battle raged, its casualties mutely entombed in the filing cabinets, swathed in directives with carbon copies and counter-directives with carbon copies. It was not a bloody battle. It was fought with words and words and words of argument, counter-thrust, statement, rebuttal and rejoinder, espionage and security. The objective was control. For Howard Mangler objected most violently to having a mere businessman running the delicate field of operations while Philip Newton felt that physicists should stay in their white ivory tower and let businessmen run the details of business. Open battle did not join every day. Sometimes it smouldered for weeks before breaking out in a welter of directives, memorandums and hot words. But any long period of quiet brought a foreboding of imminent war to the office force, and when the first thrust was sent home, the force cleared its desk so that the passage of memorandums could flow untrammeled by the processes of work. The rumour of war preceded the opening of hostilities by long enough for preparation so that, Lillian, you'd better polish off that batch of invoices quick-like. In a hurry? We will be. Grant has just invaded Richmond. Oh. Sometimes it was Shiloh, but when Grant invaded Richmond... It meant that Howard Mangler had stamped down the long corridor to blast his way through the defences of the outer office of Philip Newton and into the inner sanctum itself, and was now firing his big guns in the enemy's face. "'This has got to go through!' roared Mangler. "'It is unnecessary.' "'How do you know?' demanded Mangler. "'The inventory says we have twelve tetrascopes now. What do we need with four more?' "'Because we have more men!' Newton snorted. "'Does each man need a complete set of laboratory equipment?' "'Not a complete set, but a thing like this!' 
I've been through there recently and found no less than eight of them not even turned on, let alone being used. Mangler grunted. It's not the constant use that demands extra equipment. It's the fact that it takes time for a man to run down what he needs, borrow it, set it up, and then return it. You'll have to continue that way for a bit. We're over our budget now. By forty thousand? Almost. Mangler sat back with a derisive gesture. And I know why, he said with scorn. Indeed? I do. You've sent through an appropriation for fifty thousand for your own fool. I'm no fool, Mangler. You are. If so, you are an opinionated idiot. My opinion is quite valid. In your own opinion, your own opinion is valid. Stop defining A in terms of A. Mangler, if I did that, you'd be the first to scorn my definitions. What in the devil do you know about atomics, anyway? Only what you've taught me. If I'm a fool, it's your fault. What do you know about business? Enough to make a time study and add up to four. Enough to balance the price of equipment against the lost man hours because of the lack of it, and come up with a mathematical decision. But an eminently impractical decision. Blood cannot be extracted from a radish. No, but you can dig up a bunch of radishes, sell them, and buy a pint of blood. That takes time. Just wait. As soon as we catch up with that budget. If you hadn't sent through that appropriation. I have that right. For what? A device that, first, is needed right in our laboratory, and second, will eventually bring in millions once it is developed in large size. And may I ask the nature of this marvellous instrument? Mangler. What would the ultimate worth of a device I can extract the radioactivity of? Worth billions, but it can't be. Exactly. Such a device would be worth billions. Trillions, any number you want. It just ain't practical. In words of one syllable that even you can understand, such a process does not exist, nor can such a device be made. This decision of yours is, I gather, final. It is no decision of mine. It is the opinion of every scientist worthy of the name. Who, of course, know all there is to know, sneered Newton. Extracting the radioactivity from a radioactive substance is impossible. Come now, Dr. Mangler. There were learned gentlemen who proved conclusively that no vehicle heavier than air could ever get off the ground under its own power. Granted, Using the same mathematics, it is possible to prove that the bumblebee is aerodynamically impossible. The half-life of a radio element is set by the nuclear structure of the element. What you are stating is that the half-life of any radio element can be cut down? Not at all. I am stating that I intend to purchase a machine that will completely remove radioactivity regardless of half-life. Mangler sneered. Tell me, Newton. If you were to put a lump of radium before this machine, would it turn out to be stable radium, or convert itself all the way down the radioactive ladder to inert lead in the same instant? This is the sort of hypothetical question you always enjoy tossing around, Mangler. I suggest that you procure half pound or so of radium, and we'll try it. Then you have only rumour to go on. Look, Mangler, let's make a premise or two. You'll not deny that I know what a Geiger counter is and how it is used? I'll grant that. All right, then. Now, I've been shown a machine and a sample of radioactive material. I've been permitted to test this radioactive sample extensively. In fact, I had it here for a few hours using our own test equipment, and it was definitely radioactive. This is established to your satisfaction. Go on. Then this sample was placed in the machine, and within a matter of a minute or so, the sample was returned to me, inert and cold. "'May I ask whether there might have been a substitution of sample?' asked Mangler with a sneer. "'No, there was not. I have it here.' And Newton tossed a lump of stuff on the desk. "'Can a tight core,' said Mangler, picking it up, and looking at it through a jeweller's loop that he took from his vest pocket, or at least what appears to be. I put my own mark on it, said Newton complacently. Mangler eyed Newton coldly. He started to say something, but stopped before he began. 
Newton smiled serenely and went on. This is merely a pilot model, he said. With a bit of development, the device can be made to work on a large scale. We can decontaminate our byproducts. We can render safe any radioactive area. Why, the value of machinery toss out every month will pay for it in a short time. Time and time again, something in the hot cave breaks down. Last week it was five hundred dollars worth of analytical balance discarded because of a broken bearing worth about a dollar and a half. It wouldn't work right, and was so hot that no one could repair it safely. Think of it. As you said before, such a machine would be worth billions, but no such machine can possibly exist. Are you certain of this? Of course I'm certain. Which means, naturally, that you know all there is to know. I know what is the common knowledge of the topmost scientists of the world, including the recent discoveries of the men who work behind the Iron Curtain. Russia has no corner on brains, nor have we. Just remember that. So this miraculous gadget came from Russia? It did. Indeed. Don't scoff. Dr. Velikov escaped with his life. And the machine, of course. Yes. He stole the pilot model and escaped. Go on, Newton. Mangler's use of Philip Newton's last name was scornful. A sore spot frequently rubbed raw. Mangler used it in the same scornful tone whenever Newton tried to invade the premises of science. Mangler's tone inferred that Newton was identifying himself with Sir Isaac Newton. It was in the same level of ridicule as calling a bald man curly. Dr. Velikov wanted out. He escaped with no more than his clothing and the machine. It fits into a small metal cabinet, because he knew that it would bring him enough money here to permit his comfortable escape and ultimate freedom. Even now, he is not free from danger because the Soviet agents are everywhere, and doubtless most of them are on the lookout for him. Naturally, nodded Mangler in a soft voice. He came to me because he knew I was investigated and cleared for secret data by the government, and therefore could have no connection with the Soviet. He was extremely cautious at first, but he's relaxed since. Why, it was at least three weeks before he would show me his machine. Which you swallowed hook, line, and sinker. But not without careful investigation. Such as? I've seen it work, snapped Newton. This I'd like to see myself. I'll take you along tomorrow, excepting for one thing. Tomorrow? I'm giving Dr. Velikov the voucher and taking possession of the machine tomorrow morning at ten Ak Emma. And your objections? You'd foul up the deal. How? Like most of your ilk, you'd want to spend a few years investigating the properties of the machine. You'd have someone make a mathematical analysis of the process, want to test it on this and that, and then you'd priff around for six more months before you decided whether to pay off now or a year from now. In the meantime, Dr. Velikov would be in great danger, if not dead by then. And if I promise not to interfere? Under those circumstances... Mangler eyed Newton calculatingly. Will you put in writing a statement that you are inviting me to witness this affair under the single provision that I interfere in no way, shape, or fashion with your business deal with this Dr. Velikov? I'd be most happy to. Good, said Mangler, with a smile. This will be double protection. If I interfere and louse up the deal, you'll be able to clip me. If I don't bother to keep you out of a sucker's bait, you won't be able to blame your mistake on my silence. That's a deal. Deal! said Mangler. Mangler turned and left the office. His passage along the corridor was followed by the eyes of the office force, and when Newton called for his secretary to come in for dictation, there was a general cleaning of desks. The primary cause for another mild paper shortage was expected to arise at any moment now. Newton rapped at the hotel door, and the door opened after a minute. It opened a mere crack first, then it swung wide as Dr. Velikov saw Philip Newton. "'Come in,' he said in a rather thick accent. Then he saw Mangler and frowned. 
He started to swing the door shut. He looked at Newton with a half-trapped expression which was as though he felt that a trusted friend had betrayed him. "'Don't worry,' said Newton cheerfully. "'This is Dr. Howard Mangler.' "'How do you do?' inquired the Russian uncertainly. "'Fine, thank you,' responded Mangler. "'Dr. Mangler is safe. I can—' "'Now that I know his name, I know,' said Dr. Velikov. "'He works with you.' "'That's right. However, I'd have preferred it otherwise. Yet he is here,' said Velikov in a resigned tone. "'You can be sure that your secret is safe with him?' "'This I am sure of,' nodded the Russian quickly. "'Yet the best of intentions sometimes, you understand. I have no lack of faith in you, Dr. Mangler. In fact, I have been most happy to meet you under other circumstances.' But like most questions of security, the safest secret is one which is not labelled secret and which is known only to the absolute minority. Mangler nodded. I know very well how this thing can affect you. Have no fear. I'm here only as a curious physicist who wants to see the first machine in operation, a machine that apparently does what cannot be done. I'll be glad to show it to you said Velikov smoothly. To Newton, he said, "'Everything is ready?' "'Of course,' nodded Newton. He reached into an inside pocket and produced an envelope which he handed to Velikov. "'Sorry that it must be a certified check, Dr. Velikov.' "'I understand. It is as sound as cash.' "'I assure you it is.' Velikov nodded, and then looked at Mangler. "'You are sceptical, he said sincerely but only because you do not understand. Mangler nodded cynically. According to what is known about radioactivity, you are about to violate something of a universal law. Velikov shook his head. Universal laws cannot be violated. When a universal law obstructs scientific achievement, the thing to do is to work it so that the universal law can be turned around to operate in your favour. And— said Mangler pointedly, one can sometimes evade the law for a period of time during which one can get away with some amazing things, but always the law catches up with one. You do not believe. Frankly, no, but I'm willing to be shown. Then come, and Velikov led the two Americans from the reception room of the hotel suite to the bedroom. There it is, he said proudly. There it was. Mangler eyed the setup critically. Scientist, experimenter, and practical engineer, Mangler looked the equipment over with his experienced eye. The stuff had been sent up on one of the long portable tables used by hotels to furnish display tables in conventions and the like, and the construction of the table precluded any undercover fancy work. Smooth but bare boards were set upon sturdy horses. A single line cord led from the wall socket to a small metal case studded with convenience outlets in which several AC-operated gadgets were plugged, standard as could be. At one end of the table was a rather expensive analytical balance. Next to it was a volumetric graduate and system to measure the true volume of an irregular solid to a remarkable degree of precision. Not content to use these pieces for the purpose, the third equipment on the table was a simple but accurate equipment for measuring the specific gravity of solids. There was a spectrometer and its associated gear, the use of which could give an extremely close estimate of the composition of a sample. A small sliver taken from a larger sample could be tested, and from the proportion of sample to sliver, the elemental structure of the larger sample could be obtained. Some electrical equipment came next, specific resistivity, magnetic moment, dielectric constant, piezoelectric axes. We do not use them all on every sample, said Velikov. One could hardly measure the dielectric constant of a block of radio silver, for instance. But silver, like all metals, still has a dielectric constant. Of course and a block of copper has an index of refraction. These are scientific measurements, and concepts are not practical for this purpose. 
Here, we work on the concrete and not the abstract. Mangler shrugged. The next bits of equipment he recognised. One was a counting rate meter that had the nameplate of a popular manufacturer of scientific equipment. Next to it was a portable giga counter, which had the inventory plate of General Atomic Research screwed to the panel. That's here on lend -lease, said Newton cheerfully. Mangler nodded again. From what he could see, Velikov's equipment was beyond reproach. Used under the eyes of Newton, nothing short of a hidden cyclotron could create a false impression of radioactivity of an, in an inert sample. Used in front of Mangler, not even a hidden cyclotron could be used to falsify any evidence. But it was the final item on the board that interested Mangler. It was a small, leatherette-covered case with a suitcase handle on one side. It had a panel across the face which was covered with dials etched in Russian characters. Below the characters indicating the function of the several dials, someone, either Velikov or Newton, had used a grease pencil to letter in the English equivalent of mass, of volume, of the various factors that are the measurements of matter. And the bottom row of dials could be set to the activity constant of radioactive emanations, alpha, beta, and gamma. The case came open in the middle. This control panel and its insides filled one half of the split case. The other half was open behind it, and it was obvious that the equipment standing next to the control panel fitted neatly into the open half of the carrying case. The base of this equipment was a larger cylinder made up of an electromagnet. The core was laminated. The ends of the laminations showed across the flat dome of the cylinder. The coil of wire came up even with the top of the laminations, so that little of the surface of the cylinder could be seen. The bottom was a flat circle of metal large enough to extend beyond the coil. It made a neat base. Rising from the metal base were three metal struts that passed up, almost touching the outsides of the electromagnet, to a superstructure above the flat face of the laminated core of the magnet. It was obvious that the sample would rest on this flat face. The three struts held a spiral of glass tubing that was terminated in electrodes similar to the terminals of a neon sign tubing. These were connected to the cable that led from the gear to the control box. Atop the glass spiral was a flat circle of aluminium. Radioactivity is a state of instability in the nucleus, explained Velikov. Mangler nodded. Velikov had said nothing that could not be obtained from a fundamental book on atomics, circa 1935. The condition known as half-life obtains because of the statistical nature of atomic structure. Any single atom is not radioactive. It is only in an instable state in which it contains more than enough energy to hold it together. When it ejects this excess energy, it is radioactive only for that instant. Then it becomes a stable nucleus. But when a statistical quantity of such atoms are present, and any gross matter, no matter how minute, will contain a statistical quantity, there is always some number of atoms in the radioactive state of ejecting the excess energy. Some do it quickly, others take their time. In order to remove the excess energy all at once, it is necessary to control the nuclear particles themselves. Which, up to now, has not been done, suggested Mangler. Right, beamed Velikov. An instable atom can be considered as a billiard table with the balls in motion. The stable state consists of the balls at rest. In the radioactive atom, the balls contain a total excess energy sufficient to drive any of the balls from the table, but this excess energy is divided among them. Until the random motion of the components and the attendant transfer of energy from one to the other results in one component eventually containing this excess energy all to itself, nothing happens. Then, when this does happen, the ball has enough energy to leave the place. In other words, the particle is ejected. 
Fundamental, said Mangler. But how do you control the nuclear particles with this equipment? By inserting the radioactive sampled fields which work on the electrostatic, the momentomagnetic, and the mechanogravitic properties of the nucleus. This I've got to see, said Mangler. Velikov nodded. From a heavy metal case he took a small lump of stuff that looked like a piece of ore. He handed the long tongs to Mangler, who viewed the sample from a safe distance through a piece of leaded glass conveniently placed on the table. "'You expect trickery,' said Velikov. His tone suggested that he was unhappy that Mangler did not believe him. "'Mark it, if you like.' "'I'd like to, but I'd rather not get that close to hot stuff.' Then inspect it carefully, and note anything characteristic about its structure. That way you can be sure. Just put the show on the road, said Mangler. All right. Velikov tested the sample before the giga and the counting rate meter. From readings obtained, he set the dials on the control box. Then Velikov spent many minutes weighing, measuring, and testing the sample transferring mass, volume, and so forth to the proper dials on the box. He retested the sample before the counters and rechecked his dial settings, which he did not have to change. You will notice that the radioactivity has not diminished in the half hour I've used to measure the sample, said Velikov. Mangler chuckled. The intensity there, he said with a wave at the counters, it's such that any short-term half-life radioactive you could get would have started off hotter than Oak Ridge itself. Go ahead. Velikov lifted the top aluminium plate and set the sample on the laminated end of the electromagnet. With the top plate back in place, the sample could be seen through the coils of the glass spiral. Now, said Velikov sharply. He thrust in a small switch on the instrument panel. There came a faint sizzle of corona, and the top circular plate showed a few leakage spikes from some sharp edges. There was a general but very gentle tugging at iron containing items in the pockets. The sample moved a bit. A meter moved swiftly off the scale toward the red line, and as it reached the line, the coils of glass flared with blinding brilliance, and a faint metallic ting rang from the equipment. Velikov laughed. "'I know best of all that we should not look at it,' he said, "'but even I cannot avoid it.' Mangler looked towards the ceiling. There was a spiral image that moved with his eyes, a scintillating retained impression that changed in colour from flaming green to beautiful blue to blood-red, then white, then blue, then green again. It faded slowly. It appeared in changing colour behind the closed eyelids. It became bright again, and died again, and faded away to return. Looking at the sample, the retained colour in the eye image matched the equipment and registered with a glass spiral that made it look as though it was still glowing. Velikov lifted the top plate and took the sample out with his bare hands. He handed it to Mangler and said, Test it. It was dead. Mangler looked at it, then looked at the equipment. This I've got to inspect, he said in a low voice. Velikov smiled. Now you believe. I'd never believe it possible. Newton smiled self-confidently. We'll have plenty of time to see what makes it tick, he said. But where does the activity go? asked Mangler. It is changed into harmless radiations of mere light, a bit of electrostatic discharge, and a burst of a magnetic field, said Velikov. All energy has an equivalent wavelength. By inserting the proper equivalent wavelength artificially, and exciting the material properly, the energetic radiation is heterodyned into harmless energy which can be dissipated easily. Amazing! Have you another sample? No, unfortunately. Radioisotopes cost money. Why? I'd like to try it again. You may do it at your laboratory, 
this machine is now yours. Then let's take it out of here. Quick, I've got work to do. Newton smiled. We'd like another check out on the process, he said. Well, we can go through the mere motions, said Velikov slowly. Oh no, said Newton. I have a sample here with me. With you? exploded Mangler. That's dangerous, you idiot! Not at all, smiled Newton, taking a small flat case from his pocket. It was heavy. Lead. He pried it open on the table with a long screwdriver and lifted a small sample out of the case with the tongs. Now we can do it again, he said happily. The counters chattered happily as Newton held the sample in front of the probes. Velikov looked at his watch. Would you like to try it? he asked nervously. The banks close at noon today, you know. You have a half hour. Then there's always tomorrow. Velikov shook his head. Tomorrow I must be gone, he said. There are men who would kill me for what I've done. Newton smiled. You have a good half hour. I'd like some instructions, please. Velikov nodded. You do it, he said, but please hurry. The measurements take time. I know, but, well, go ahead. Newton nodded and put the sample on the scales. His hands fumbled a bit and he started over. Please hurry. I guess that's close enough, said Newton. He set the mass dial, looked at it, looked back at the balance, then shrugged. He dunked the sample in the volumetric graduate, flashed it through the electrical bridges and made the appropriate settings on the dials of the control box. You're being rather sloppy, said Mangler pointedly. I fear he has been too sloppy, said Velikov, but we have too little time to repeat. You set the radioactive constants, said Newton to Mangler. Mangler thought for a moment and then set them, and his setting was precise. Now, said Newton, he thrust the switch home. Again came the brief sizzle of corona, the urge of magnetic attraction, and then the blinding flare of light. Newton reached for the sample. No, said Velikov quickly. Why? Mangler grunted. You've been as sloppy as a kid, he sneered. That sample is probably as hot as it was. But you have the right process, said Velikov, and now I must get going. Shrugging, Newton took up the tongs, lifted the sample from its place, and thrust it in front of the counter. The counter was silent. Dead, glowed Newton. Hmm. Velikov turned back from the door. Dead, he said. Dead? Dead, said Newton. I couldn't have been as sloppy as you accused me of being. Maybe the thing isn't as demanding as you suggest, said Mangler. We'll find out, said Newton. Howard, help me pack up. Sure. Velikov shook his head. He handed the envelope back to Newton. Newton took it, wonderingly. Why? I'm not selling, said Velikov. But you did sell. It's mine, ours. You took your envelope back, Mangler growled. Not if I have anything to say about it. Velikov eyed Mangler, looked the big man up and down. But this isn't. Mangler flexed his hands. You can't play that game with us, he snarled. What do you want? More money? I want my machine. It has just occurred to me that I know how to exploit it for myself, in safety from my countrymen. Well, you can't back out of a contract that easily. This is a matter of business, Newton said softly as he waved Mangler aside which comes under my jurisdiction. I'll handle it. All right, but don't let him get away with that machine. Business is business, smiled Newton. Then to Velikov he said, Business is one of the things we Americans specialize in, you know. I see, said Velikov. You want a profit.
We want the machine. This is my job, Howard, Newton nodded at Velikov. Make me an offer. You have your original fifty thousand. I'll buy the machine back for ten thousand. No. Twenty. No. Twenty-five. Hmm. Look, Newton, this is worth a lot more than that. Thirty. Make it fifty. Done. Cash. Velikov went to the dresser drawer and took out a sheaf of bills. He counted off fifty of them and handed them to Newton. Now get out, he snapped. Oh, come now, let's be friends. So that he can see my machine and copy it? No. Come on, Mangler, let's go. Newton led Mangler from the room. The elevator that came for them also dropped six policemen who hurried up the hall. They were rapping on the door as the elevator door closed. "'You're an imbecile!' snapped Mangler. "'I know what you're thinking, that I could reproduce that machine. But I can't. I can't. And you've sold it back for a measly fifty thousand. You're an imbecile. It's worth millions.' "'No, just fifty thousand, said Newton, waving his envelope. "'But Velikov will make millions.' "'He may have,' chuckled Newton. But not any more. The gentleman in uniform will see to that. What do you mean? Mangler, I bow to your knowledge in matters scientific, but the Commission put me in charge of business because you are incredibly naive. A few years ago they were selling little doohickeys at printed dollar bills. Ten days after Hiroshima there were advertisements for everything from atomic permanent waves to atomic patent pills. Develop something new and there will be ten sharpers making sucker money out of it. But what happened? Newton chuckled. First, Velikov, who is a charlatan of the first water, demonstrated a machine to me. I, a simple businessman, was duly impressed by the wonders of science. I agreed to buy this fabulous gadget for fifty grand. Then, he continued cheerfully, I mentioned it to you. You jeered, and then finally went along with the gags that you'd have the splendid opportunity of watching me get clipped. And then again he went on even more cheerfully. The man who knew it wouldn't work in the first place was convinced by a bit of sleight of hand. There, Mangler, you did a fine job for me. Mangler growled. Yeah, how? By acting on natural self, the brainy physicist being convinced by a gadget you convinced the charlatan he had something. But, Newton grinned, Mangler, you should know by now that cylindrical magnet cores are never made of laminations because it is just as efficient to make a square core out of laminations. Turning a laminated core is an unnecessary nuisance. Yes. So I figured that the only reason for making a laminated cylindrical core was to conceal some minute crack the sort of crack that would be visible on a smooth surface. The sort of crack made by a pair of cunning trapdoors. Two samples, elaborately sculpted into remarkable similarity, one radioactive and one dead. God knows how many times Velikov has done this bit of legend men at 50G a clip. Safe, too, because no man would care to handle the hot sample close enough to mark it. The flare of photostrobe light to blind the eyes, the elaborate preparations, and all the rest. And so, the gent who's going to watch me get clipped fell for the job itself. Newton roared with laughter. But— Oh, said Newton cheerfully, even you don't get it? No. Simple. You see, I had to make a profit. I used a few thousand dollars worth of radon gas. Radon gas and beryllium produce lots and lots of neutrons. Neutrons can bombard elements. I had one of you boys prepare one of the short-term elements for me and put it in my little lead box. One of the five-minute half-lives that would activate the counters and then die out in the half-hour it took to run through the measurements. By being sloppy in my analysis, I convinced Velikov that his equipment could be made to actually work if he figured out how wrong to set his dials. Newton waved the envelope at Mangler. So from here on, you stay at your end of the hall and run the gadgets, and I'll stay at my end and run the business, 
and if you are a good gadgeteer, I'll put through your request, not order, for tectroscopes. I guess we can afford it now. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Alois by R. A. Lafferty Originally published in Galaxy Magazine, August 1961 Narrated by Tom Trussell He had flared up more brightly than anyone in memory, and then he was gone. Yet there was ironic laughter where he had been, and his ghost still walked. That was the oddest thing, to encounter his ghost. It was like coming suddenly on Halley's comic, drinking beer at the plugged nickel bar, and having it deny that it was a celestial phenomenon at all, that it had never been beyond the sun. For it could have been the man of the century, and now it was not even know if he was alive. And if he were alive, it would be very odd if he would be hanging around places like the plugged nickel bar. This all begins with the award, but before that it begins with a man. Professor Alois Foulcault Erg was acutely embarrassed and in a state of dread. These I have to speak to, all these great men. Is even glory worth a price when it must be paid in such coin? Alois did not have the amenities, the polish, the tact, a child of penury. He had all his life eaten bread that was part sawdust, and worn shoes that were past cardboard. He had an overcoat that had been his father's, and before that his grandfather's. This coat was no longer handsome, its hole being stuffed and quilted with ancient rags. It was long past its years of greatness, and even when Eloise had inherited it as a young man it was in the afternoon of its life and yet it was worth more than anything else he owned in the world. Professor Alois had become great in spite of, or because of, his poverty. He had worked out his finest theory, a series of nineteen interlocked equations of cosmic shapeliness and simplicity. He had worked it out on a great piece of butcher's paper soaked with lamb's blood, and had so given it to the world and once it was given, it was almost as though nothing else could be added on any subject whatsoever. Any further detailing would be only footnotes to it, and all the sciences no more than commentaries. Naturally, this made him famous. But the beauty of it was that it made him famous not to the commonality of mankind. This would have been a burden to his sensitively tuned soul but to a small and scattered class of extremely erudite men, about a score of them in the world, their recognition brought him almost, if not quite, complete satisfaction. But he was not famous in his own street or his own quarter of town, and it was in this dark conglomerate of dark-souled alleys and roofs that Professor Alois had lived all his life till just thirty-seven days ago. When he received the announcement, award, and invitation, he quickly calculated the time. It was not very long to allow travel halfway around the world. Being locked out of his rooms, as he often was, he was unencumbered by baggage or furniture, and he left for the ceremony at once. With the announcement, award, and invitation, there had also been a check, but it was not overly familiar with the world of finance or with the English language in which it was written. He did not recognise it for what it was. Having used the back of it to write down a formula that had crept into his mind, he shoved the cheque, forgotten, into one of the pockets of his greatcoat. For three days he rowed a riverboat to the port city, hidden and hungry. There he concealed himself on an ocean tramp, that he did not starve on this was due to the caprice of the low-lifers who discovered him, for they made him stay hidden in a terrible bunker, and every day or two they passed in a bucket to him. Then several ports, and many days later, he left the ship like a crippled, dirty animal, 
and was in that city and on that day, for the award was to be that evening. These I have to speak to, all these wonderful men who are higher than the grocers, higher than the butchers even. These men get more respect than a policeman, than a canal boat captain. They are wiser than a mayor, and more honoured than a merchant. They know arts more intricate than a clockmaker's, and are virtuous beyond the politicians. More perspicacious than editors, more talented than actors, these are the great men of the world. And I am only a lois, and now I am too ragged and dirty even to be a lois any more. I no longer am a man with a name. For he was very humble as he walked the great town where even the shop girls were dressed like princesses, and all the restaurants were so fine that only the rich people would have dared to go in them at all. Had there been poor people, and there were none, there would have been no place for them to eat. But it is to me they have given the prize, not to Schellendor, and not to Ottobaum, not to Franks, nor to Miriasef, not even to Pitirimkos, the latchet of whose shoe I am not, but why do I say that? He was not, after all, very bright. All of them are inadequate in some way. The only one who was ever able to get to the heart of these great things was Alois Fulcourt Erg, who happens to be myself. It is a strange thing that they should honour me, and yet I believe they could not have made a better choice. So pride and fear warred in him, but it was always the pride that lost for he had only a little bit of pride, undernourished and on quaking ground, and against it was a whole legion of fears, apprehensions, shames, dreads, embarrassments, and nightmarish bashfulnesses. He begged a little bit when he had found a poor part of town, but even here the people were of the rich poor, not the poor as he had known them. When he had money in his pocket, he had a meal, then he went to Jiffy Quick, while the can wait cleaners open day and night to have his clothes cleaned. He wrapped himself in dignity and a blanket while he waited, and as the daylight was coming to an end, they brought his clothes back to him. We have done all we could do. If we had a week or a month, we might do a little more, but not much. Then he went out into the town, cleaner than he had been in many years and he walked to the hall of the commendation and award. Here he watched all the great men arrive in private cars and taxis. Ergo Dick Eimer, August Angstrom, Vladimir Vor. He watched them and thought of what he would say to them, and then he realised that he had forgotten his English. I remember dog. That is the first word I ever learned, but what will I say to them about a dog? I remember house, and horse, and apple, and fish. Now I remember the entire language. But what if I forget it again? Would it not be an odd speech if I could only say apple, and fish, and house, and dog? I would be shamed. He wished he were rich, and could dress in white like the street sweepers, or in black leather like the newsboy on the corner. He saw Edward Edelstein, and Christopher Cronin enter, and he cowered on the street, and knew that he would never be able to talk to those great men. A fine gentleman came out and walked directly to him. "'You are the great professor, Fulcourt Erg. I would have known you anywhere. True greatness shines from you. Our city is honoured to-night. Come inside, and we will go to a little room apart, for I see that you will have to compose yourself first. I am Graf Dr. Hercule Bienville Stravloglin. Why ever he said he was the Graf Doctor is a mystery, because it was Willie McGilly, and the other was just a name that he had made up that minute. Within, they went to a small room behind the cloakroom, but here, in spite of the smooth kindness of the gracious gentleman, Alois knew that he would never be able to compose himself. He was an epouvantail, a pugilo, a clown, a rag a muffin. He looked at the nineteen-point outline of the address he was to give. He shuddered, and he gobbled like a turkey. He sniffed, 
and he wiped his nose on his sleeve. He was terrified that the climax of his life's work should find him too craven to accept it, and he discovered that he had forgotten his English again. I remember bread and butter, but I don't know which one goes on top. I know pencil and penknife and bed, but I have entirely forgotten the word for maternal uncle. I remember plough, but what in the world will I say to all these great men about a plough? I pray that this cup may pass from me. Then he disintegrated in one abject mass of terror. Several minutes went by. But when he emerged from the room he was a different man entirely, erect, alive, intense, queerly handsome, and now in formal attire. He mounted with the sure grace of a panther to the speaker's platform. Once only he glanced at the nineteen-point outline of his address. As there is no point in keeping it a secret, it was as follows. 1. Seafide in cerium. How long is a yardstick? 2. Double trouble. Is ours a binary universe? 3. Cerebrum and cortex. The mathematics of melancholia. 4. Microphysics and megacyclic polynomes. 5. Ego no hemes, the personality of the subconscious. 6. Linear convexity and lateral intransigence. 7. Betelgeuse betrayed, the myth of magnitude. 8. Mu Meesen, the secret of metamorphosis. 9. Theogony and Tremor, The Mathematics of Seismology. 10. Planck's Constant and Agnesi's Variable. 11. Diencephalon and Di Gamma, Unconscionable Thoughts About Consciousness. 12. Inverse Squares and the Quintessimal Radicals. 13. The Chain of Error in the Lineal B Translation. 14. Scepticism, the humour of the humorless. 15. O give and volute, thoughts on celestial curvature. 16. Conic sections, small pieces of infinity. 17. Eschatology, medium thoughts about the end. 18. Hypopolarity and cosmic hysteresis. 19. The Invisible Quadratic, or This is all simpler than you think. You will immediately see the beauty of this skeleton, and yet to flesh it would not be the work of ordinary man. He glanced over it with a sure smile of complete confidence. Then he spoke softly to the Master of Ceremonies in a whisper with a rumble that could be heard throughout the hall. I am here. I will begin. There is no need for any further introduction. For the next three and a half hours he held that intelligent audience completely spellbound, enchanted. They followed, or seemed to follow, his lightning flashes of metaphor illumining the craggy chasms of his vasty subjects. They thrilled to the magnetic power of his voice, urbane yet untamed with its polyglot phrasing and its bare touch of accent so strange as to be baffling, ancient, surely, and yet from a land beyond the pale. And they quivered with interior pleasure at the glorious unfolding in climax after climax of these before only half-glimpsed vistas. Here was a world of mystery revealed in all its wildness, and it obeyed and stood still, and he named its name. The nebula and the conch lay down together, and the ultra-galaxies equated themselves with the zeta mesons. Like a rich householder, he brought from his store treasures old and new, and nothing like them had ever been seen or heard before. At one point, Professor Timiryasev cried out in bafflement and incomprehension, and Dr. Ergodic Eimer buried his face in his hands, for even these most erudite men could not glimpse all the shattering profundity revealed by the fantastic speaker. 
and when it was over, they were limp and delighted that so much had been made known to them. They had the crown without the cross, and the odd little genius had filled them with a rich glow. The rest was perfunctory, commendations and testimonials from all the great men. The trophy, heavy and rich but not flashy, worth the lifetime salary of a professor of mathematics, was accepted almost carelessly, and then the cup was passed quietly, which is to say the tall cool glasses went around as the men still lingered and talked with hushed pleasure. "'Gin,' said the astonishing orator, "'it is a drink of bums and impoverished scholars, and I am both. Yes, anything at all with it.' Then he spoke to Maecenas, who was at his side, the patron who was footing the bill for all this gracious extravagance. The cheque I have never cashed, having been much in movement since I have received it, and as to me it is a large amount, though perhaps not to others, and as you yourself have signed it, I wonder if you could cash it for me now. At once, said Maecenas, at once. Ten minutes and we shall have the sum here. Ah, you have endorsed it with a formula. Who but Professor Alois Fulcourt Erg could be so droll? Look, he has endorsed it with a formula. Look, look, let us copy. Why, this is marvellous. It takes us even beyond his great speech of to-night, the implications of it. Oh, the implications, they said as they copied it off, and the implications rang in their heads like bells of the future. Now it had suddenly become very late, and the elated little man with the golden-gemmed trophy under one arm and the packet of banknotes in his pocket disappeared as by magic. Professor Alois Foucault Erg was not seen again, or, if seen, he was not known, for hardly anyone would have known his face. In fact, when he had painfully released the bonds by which he had been tied in the little room behind the cloakroom and removed the shackles from his ankles, he did not pause at all, but slipped into his greatcoat and ran out into the night. Not for many blocks did he even remove the gag from his mouth, not realising in his confusion what it was that obstructed his speech and breathing. But when he got it out, it was a pleasant relief. A kind gentleman took him in hand, the second to do so that night. He was bundled into a kind of taxi and driven to a mysterious quarter called Wreckville and deep inside a secret building he was given a bath and a bowl of hot soup, and later he gathered with others at a festive board. Here Willie McGilly was king, and he worked his way into his cups with a gold trophy in front of him. He expounded and elucidated. I was wonderful. I held them in the palm of my hand. Was I not wonderful, Erg? I could not hear at all, for I was on the floor of the little room, but from what I could hear, yes, you were wonderful. Only once in my life did I give a better speech. It was the same speech, but it was newer then. This was in Little Dogie, New Mexico, and I was selling a snake oil derivative whose secret I still cannot reveal. But I was good to-night, and some of them cried. And now what will you do, Erg? Do you know what we are? Moshenekov. Why, so we are, Schwindlern, the very word. Low-life conman, and the world you live on is not the one you were born on. I will join you if I may. Erg, you have a talent for going to the core of the apple. For when a man, however unlikely a man, shows real talent, then the Wreckville bunch has to recruit him. They cannot have uncontrolled talent running loose in the commonality of mankind. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!